Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I sincerely welcome you to uh, this event today. My name is Keigo Kumamura, uh, a director of uh, uh, Keigo Global uh, Research Institute, KGLI, and uh, I'm a professor of law at, at this university. And also I'm uh, vice president of Keigo University. In the first place, uh, as a director of KGLI, I would like to make a brief introduction uh, of uh, KGLI and uh, uh, this event. Uh, KGLI was established uh, two years ago, uh, 2016. Uh, so it, it is a, a kind of a baby uh, institution so far. Uh, these years, as you know, uh, the Japanese government uh, have been uh, uh, encouraging uh, the Japanese universities to enhance uh, the globalization uh, much more than ever uh, and to start the financial support program uh, for that purpose. Uh, not just from the governmental uh, uh, background, but, but also uh, from the, uh, our own needs and the passions. Uh, Keio University decided to set up uh, a new platform where many faculties and the researchers, academic resources, uh, can get together to exchange ideas and uh, do uh, various collaborative works uh, beyond the specific uh, uh, disciplines and beyond uh, uh, departments and the centers and beyond uh, 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 campuses and the national borders. So we are running KGLI as a very uh, transdisciplinary uh, base. And the research projects in, in this uh, institute are wide range, ranging uh, from uh, 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 anti-aging uh, treatment and uh, uh, generative uh, medical uh, technologies to uh, uh, national securities and uh, uh, cyber civilization and, uh, and so on. Along this line, uh, uh, we launch a new uh, lecture series uh, in which we invite distinguished speakers from the, all over the world uh, to uh, give us uh, uh, thought-provoking uh, lectures um, to uh, change uh, our, our society uh, and lead our society to a, a new uh, step. Uh, today we have uh, Mr. Uh, Ivan Wolfson uh, here to talk about the LGBT issues uh, and to share his experiences. And he uh, 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 raises minority voices and uh, uh, changes the United States uh, by legal uh, measures and uh, strategies. Actually, I am also teaching constitutional law at this university. So I have been uh, eagerly uh, looking forward to his talk and from the you know, uh, professional interest of my own. Uh, by the way, I have to let you know the two things before our lecture. Uh, first, uh, this event uh, will be uh, video rec recorded uh, for our archive, and it is going to be uh, open to the public. And second, official photographers uh, from the host and the co-host organizations uh, uh, walking around this room uh, today and taking the photos. Uh, thank you for understanding about the uh, video uh, recording and uh, uh, taking pictures. Before we get started, uh, a brief introduction of uh, uh, today's co-host organization, LAN, Lawyers for LGBT and the Lies Network, and uh, uh, of course today's speaker. Uh, will be uh, given by Mr. Uh, uh, Naosuke and Fujita. Mr. Fujita is a co-representative director and one of the co-founders of uh, LA. He graduated from uh, uh, Waseda University, uh, the most respectable <laughs> rival to care, <laughs> and uh, University of Michigan Law School for LLM. And uh, following a career as a business lawyer at Japanese and uh, American law firms, uh, since March uh, 2009, uh, he is a general counsel for uh, Goldman Sachs Japan. Uh, in June uh, uh, 2017, uh, Mr. Fujita was awarded by Financial Times 
the most innovative general counsel award. So please welcome Mr. Fujita. Uh, thank you very much, Kumamura Sensei. Um, and I'm sorry I'm from Waseda, but I love KO. So, <laughs> um, so uh, let me just. Uh, okay. Um, yes, thank you. So, first of all, we're very, very um, honored to co host this program with KO uh, Global Research Institute. And we are extremely grateful to Kumamura Sensei and his team for who made this happen. Um, Please bear with me, it won't be that brief. Uh, I will take about 13 minutes, I actually timed it. And I would like to introduce Evan and the organization, the Lawyers for LGBT and Allies Network. But what I would also like to describe is how our paths crossed to make our organization happen, to make this program happen, and hopefully to make many more things happen in support of LGBT um, rights going forward. So, um, um, so first of all, I don't want to embarrass Evan too much, but I did want to start with the accolades that Evan has received over the years for his activities. First, the National Law Journal in year 2000 named it the 100 most influential lawyers in America. And then in 2004, the Times Magazine, and I think he was promoted, the 100 most influential people in the world. So that's wonderful. And in 2011, Newsweek and the Daily Beast um, dubbed him the godfather of gay marriage. And furthermore, as you will see at the bottom, in 2012, Barnard College, Columbia University awarded him the Barnard Model of Distinction together with the then president, Barack Obama. So um, you wonder, how did Evan get here? And why is he respected? and admired and honored in this way. So we go back in time to April 1983, and that is Evan's picture in his 20s. And he was a third year law student at Harvard Law School. And he also the paper that's shown here, uh, it's called Same Sex Marriage and Morality, the Human Rights Vision of the Constitution. Uh, this paper was probably very new for the time, and there he outlined why freedom to marry is important and how winning marriage for same-sex couples will signal a broader path to equality for gay and lesbian Americans. He says, and I quote uh, from his message, by claiming the resonant vocabulary of marriage, love, commitment, connectedness, and freedom, we could transform non-gay people's understanding of who gay people are and why exclusion and discrimination are wrong. But the journey that started in 1983 was not an easy one. Um, Evan, shortly after law school, uh, joined Lambda Legal, which is one of the oldest and largest national legal organization whose mission is to achieve full recognition of civil rights of LGBT people through impact litigation, education, and public policy work. Evan, I guess notably, participated in and was co-counsel in the landmark litigation in Hawaii, Beya versus Lewin, in which Hawaii Supreme Court, for the first time in the United States, held that the state's prohibition on same-sex marriage was discriminatory. The victory, however, was short-lived as Hawaii legislature passed a constitutional amendment banning same-sex marriage. Another big setback was the passing into law of the Defense of Marriage Act, which is more commonly known as DOMA, by the US Congress, which denied federal marriage benefits to same-sex couples, even if their marriage is recognized in the state. So based on all of this, Evan decided that what was needed was a national campaign that would change not just the courts, but the minds and the hearts of the people and based on a national strategy. So I think he quit being a litigation lawyer, and in 2003, he founded Freedom to Marry to advance the social understanding. Now, so 32 years later from the time he wrote his paper in 1983, and 12 years later, I guess, from the time he founded the Freedom to Marry, this happened. So in, on June 26, 2015, 
the United States Supreme Court held rule to realize marriage equality throughout the United States. And as you see, it was celebrated throughout the country and throughout the world. Justice Kennedy, who is pictured on the left, in his often quoted part of the opinion stated, no union is more profound than marriage for it embodies the highest ideals of love, fidelity, devotion, sacrifice, and family. The plaintiff's hope is not to be condemned to live in loneliness, excluded from one of civilization's oldest institutions. They ask for equal dignity in the eyes of the law, and the Constitution grants them that right. So I guess that ended Evan's journey. And but did it. So actually a new journey began for Evan, and I quote from his website, he now devotes his time to advising and assisting diverse movements and causes in the US and around the world. And so actually on February 2016, Evan came to Japan. And that's where our organization's journey started. So um, our organization uh, was triggered, really, by Evan's visit in February 2016. Um, we, since then, through trial and error, sought to enlarge our membership and enlarge our network, guided by Evan and his teachings. In September 2017, last year, we became an NPO, to formalize our organization and to obtain credibility in the eyes of the public. We are still a very young and fledgling organization, but we are working towards providing impact with Evan as our mentor and guide. And very much guided by what Evan has achieved and has taught us, our mission is starting from the bottom, I think first and foremost, to promote understanding and conversation in Japan. That's our first uh, and foremost uh, thing we wanted to focus on. And through that conversation, we wanted to change the hearts and minds of the people and society at large. And through that, we wish to eliminate discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity and realize a society where all people can live with dignity and realize their full potential. And we believe marriage equality is very important in realizing that mission. Um, our members and supporters uh, have been initially major law firms in Japan that you see uh, in this slide. And also, there, there are both domestic and foreign law firms and corporate legal departments. And there are more that have joined us, but we need more members and supporters. Engagement of people is a key word for us in advancing our mission. Um, our activities to date currently focus on two main themes. First is events to promote understanding, and second is legal support. On promoting understanding, one of the things we have been doing is screening of Evan's movie, Freedom to Marry, uh, which is a movie, a documentary that shows Evan's journey from his, I guess, Harvard days or even before to realizing uh, marriage equality in the United States. It was first premiered in Japan in, at the Canadian Embassy last year. And then, as you will see on the next uh, column, uh, Sony, in September uh, 2017, um, organized a screening event, which was attended by more than 600 people. Since then, it has been shown at Ryukyu University in Okinawa. It has been sh uh, shown at corporate seminars organized by Out Japan to more than 30 corporations. And next week, the film will also be screened in various venues, including the Daini Tokyo Bar Association, an event sponsored by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and JPM, JP Morgan. It will also be in, shown in Kyoto with Niji Iro Diversity, and it will be shown in, in o Oita with uh, Nomura Securities. Uh, it has a Japanese subtitle and is available for licensing, so if you might be interested, please do contact us. Our goal to promote understanding, in, our, in that goal, we also created short documentary films, the two uh, columns to the right, 
which uh, featured two gay couples living in Japan, Ken and Kenji, who live in Saitama Kawagoe, and Machi and Teresa, uh, who live in Kyoto. They are beautiful and wonderful couples. And these are very touching videos. This video is actually available through our website, which we will introduce to you later. It's only 10 minutes, but I'm sure you will enjoy it. Please do check our website. Um, the other event we have been uh, engaged in is uh, seminars. Seminars on LGBT and LGBT rights at corporations and schools and schools. Um, the picture you see on the top is that of an in-house uh, corporate seminar at uh, LifeNet uh, Insurance Corporation that was recently held. It was attended by 70 people, which is 70% of the whole employees. And the person standing on the right hand top is Mr. Uh, President uh, Iwase, uh, Daisuke Iwase, um, uh, who, uh, uh, and uh, he was um, you know, uh, kind of leading the event. Uh, on the left hand bottom, uh, you will see uh, one of our members, uh, Tanaka Taro, speaking to uh, high school students. And in the middle, um, next to me is Inaba-san. Uh, he came out two years ago at Goldman Sachs, and he was the main reason that triggered my um, journey as an ally. Um, and you know, he looks very happy, and that's what we want to achieve. We want everyone to look as happy as he does everywhere, whether at home, at company, at workplace, at school, everywhere. That's what we want to achieve. And of course, we also hope to work with universities, prestigious ones like KO, to provide LGBT legal educations at universities and other educational institutions. That's what we are currently working on as well. And uh, the other thing that, uh, that we are uh, engaging in, in terms of promoting understanding is we have an annual gala, an annual event, which is an opportunity to promote awareness, but more importantly, to inspire people. And we have been very fortunate with Evan's support to be able to invite leading advocates from across the globe. On the right hand side, the man who looks very excited is Justice Michael Kirby. He is former justice of the Australian Supreme Court. Uh, on your far left, you see the right honorable Nick Herbert, a member of the UK parliament and the chair of the UK All Party Parliamentary Group on Global LGBT Rights. He was one of the key leaders in realizing marriage equality in the United Kingdom. In the center, you will see Victoria Su. She was one of the leaders of realizing marriage equality in Taiwan. Videos of their speech at the gala is also available together with Japanese subtitles on our website as well. On the Japan side, we were very honored and fortunate to have Gaku Hashimoto, a liberal democratic politician and a member of the House of Representatives, and perhaps more importantly, a graduate of Keio University. Um, and then on the right hand side, you will see the uh, former Olympic athlete, uh, Dai Tamesue. Tamesue-san's speech is also available uh, for viewing on our website. Oops, sorry. And uh, on the legal assistance side, uh, we have actually been um, assisting in the filing of a petition, uh, or, or a petition filed in July 2015 by more than 400 LGBT couples in Japan with the Japan Federation of Bar Association, which sought a declaration that denying marriage equality to same-sex couples is a violation of the Japanese constitution. Unfortunately, much to Evan's dismay, this is still pending, but we hope that it will uh, result in the right out outcome. And in a, to assist this petition, we authored, through our global network of law firms, a report on equal marriage in 10 key jurisdictions, which discusses how each country re realized marriage equality. Was it by the court system? Was it through the legislature system? Or was it through something else? And how the various dissents opinions against marriage equality were overcome. And on the bottom, you will see a book authored uh, by the, uh, the lawyers that filed this petition. And we at and the right hand side is the full Japanese translation of Justice Kennedy's opinion that I referred to earlier, which our organization authored. So I'm sure it's in Chaos Library, so please take a look. And I wanted to just leave you with some resources. So that is the uh, Evans Organization Freedom to Marry's website, easy to remember. 
and one below is our website, and you'll find the various videos that I refer to on that website. And um, I, I wanted to recommend Evan's book, slightly old, 2004, uh, but you know, the content is exactly what it says, why marriage matters, and it, I think it's a good starting place. And then a more recent book, uh, which features Evan's uh, journey called Engines of Liberty and how he realized um, marriage equality in the United States. And that would also, I would think, is a very good lead. So without further ado, I'd like to um, invite Evan to the podium. Thank you. Well. Thank you very much, Fujita-san. I, I think you did my work for me. You've made the case already, uh, which I appreciate. And it is an honor to be here with you today and your leadership in LAN, which has been such an important organization that, as you saw already, has made so much progress in Japan and has laid the foundation for other people to get involved in the work that's needed to finish the job here in Japan. And what I hope to be able to do today is to offer some lessons from our experience in the United States and other countries, not only on what it took to win the freedom to marry, but really on what are the elements of affecting change. How does one actually lead change in countries like the United States and Japan? And thank you very much, uh, Komomura uh, Sensei and uh, the whole uh, KO University team and Aya for your work in organizing this opportunity for us to have the discussion. I am going to talk for a little bit, but what I'm really looking forward to is the Q&A where we get into a real discussion so that everybody in this room can indeed add her or his piece to the work of achieving change in this beautiful country. So I can begin by saying that um, on June 26, 2015, as uh, uh, the two, as the two leaders here have said, uh, the United States Supreme Court handed down an extraordinarily important decision. It was a, an enormous victory that brought the freedom to marry nationwide to the United States and added enormous momentum to the worldwide conversation and movement for the freedom to marry and full equality and inclusion and vindication of human rights. The decision of the Supreme Court was, of course, a victory for same-sex couples, for our children, for our parents, our friends, our families, for our loved ones. It was a victory for millions of people, gay and the people in our lives, because it ended exclusion and discrimination and brought us into the circle of those entitled to share in the protections, responsibilities, opportunities, and promise of our country. It made a real difference in the lives of real people, predominantly gay people, and our loved ones. But the Supreme Court decision that day was not only a victory for gay people, for same-sex couples. It was also an enormous victory for the United States in this case, because it was a vindication of our country's promise to be a country of democracy, a country with the rule of law, a country where all people are created equal and entitled to enjoy full and equal participation in what our country has to offer. It was a vindication of our country's commitment to freedom and to democracy. Countries like the United States like Japan, who have these values, know how important it is that we fight to defend them. They do not defend themselves. We're going through a very difficult time in the United States. And we are called to stand up and work and defend those countries' values, the values, of course, that countries like Japan share. And so when we see a decision like the Supreme Courts of 2015, affirming those values, upholding those values, having the country live up to those values, it is a victory not just for the people involved, but a victory for the society itself. And finally, that decision that day was not just a victory for individuals, for people. It was not just a victory for values. 
It was a victory for the activists, the citizens, who had engaged in the work necessary to defend those values and secure those liberties that are promised but not always fulfilled. It was a victory for activism. It was a victory for people making the decision that they will not sit silent, but instead will do the work necessary. I mentioned that Japan, like the United States, shares the bundle of constitutional values of democracy, freedom, equality, and inclusion. One of my very, very favorite parts, however, of your constitution, the Japanese constitution, is Article 12. Because in Article 12, as I'm sure you all know here at KO, the Japanese constitution says that it is the duty of the people, of the people of Japan, through constant endeavor to uphold and to make real the guarantees in the constitution. You are charged under the constitution with doing that for your country, just as it is our obligation was our obligation and remains our obligation in the United States to do the work necessary to make sure that these values are real. And on June 26, 2015, we celebrated a success in the long story of work needed leading up to 2015 and continuing after 2015 to uphold democracy and pluralism and the rule of law and freedom and equality we had a wonderful day of celebration on June 26, 2015, and it continues to give us in the United States and you in Japan and others around the world the inspiration and instruction needed to keep going. And that's what I want to talk about today. Now, with that victory in 2015, more than a million gay people in the United States have gotten legally married. We've shown the world that gay people can marry without taking anything away from anyone else. None of the scary or bad things that our opponents said would happen have happened. It's now nearly three years since that victory. And of course, the United States was not the first. The United States was the 22nd country. When we started, we could have been the first, but it took us a while. By the time we won in the United States on June, in June of 2015, we were the 22nd. But more than a million gay people have gotten married in the United States alone, and none of the bad things have happened. The gay people did not use up all the marriage licenses. There have been no floods or locusts or earthquakes even. We have continued to move forward, and that gives inspiration and evidence to be used here in Japan and around the world. Now, one of the ways we did that, one of the key lessons of our campaign in the United States, one of the, the reasons we can celebrate this as a victory for the campaign, is that we understood that in order to achieve change in a country like Japan or the United States, it's not enough to tell. You must also show. You must show the people. You must show the stories. You must show the values. You must show people that there is a chance to move forward. In this case, I've said we can show now that there are no bad things that have happened. There's good. There's a mountain of evidence proving that ending the exclusion from marriage is good, not bad. And in the spirit of show, not tell, before I continue my talk now, I would like to take just a few minutes and show a video that was the video we showed in the United States at Freedom to Marry's celebration and going out of business party that brought together more than a thousand activists from around the United States and a few from some of the other countries we had worked with in Canada and Ireland and so on. And also the vice president of the United States, Joe Biden, all of whom gathered in New York to watch this video that I'm about to show you and to celebrate how far we've come and talk about what's needed ahead. So can we start by now showing the video? We have come a long, long way. And today we celebrate a transformation and a triumph. The freedom to marry nationwide. Progress on this journey often comes in small increments. 
Sometimes two steps forward, one step back, propelled by the persistent effort of dedicated citizens. And then sometimes there are days like this, when that slow, steady effort is rewarded with justice that arrives like a thunderbolt. Within living memory, gay people in America were a despised and oppressed minority. Our love was scorned, not respected. NBC News found that a majority felt that homosexuality was immoral. When our loved ones were sick and even dying, our own government could barely care less. Early pioneers had bravely stepped forward to claim the freedom to marry. The country wasn't ready. Their dreams were laughed at, their cases dismissed. Officials turned him down flat. A marital relationship cannot exist between faggots. But at the heart of discrimination against gay people was the denial of our love. For our dignity, our equality, our families, we had to fight to see our love respected. We had to claim the freedom to marry. Even writing my paper in 1983, I believed that our fight for the freedom to marry would be an engine of transformation. There was resistance and uncertainty, even from within the movement. A lot of people say that civil unions are the same as civil marriage, but they're absolutely different. So gay people continued to dream of being able to marry the person they loved. Then, in Hawaii, a tectonic shift. A Honolulu judge told Hawaii state government it cannot deny a marriage license to gay couples. Many, many couples stand on the brink of being able to do what every other American takes for granted, exercise the freedom to marry. But what we won was stripped away in a political attack. The president signed a bill barring federal recognition of homosexual marriages. Winning in court was not enough. We needed to build a true campaign that could drive our strategy. We needed to be able to win and defend our wins. We needed to move the country to win nationwide in the Supreme Court. And we did. Along the way, there were painful losses. Marriage is the most fundamental institution of civilization. 52% of voters supported Proposition 8 to ban gay marriage. The fact that some people would like to undo our I do makes me very sad. But we never gave up. We learned, we grew, and we won in court. By the power vested in me, I now pronounce you legally Mary. <laughs> we gave Americans a chance to see families helped and no one hurt. These couples will finally be treated equally and fairly by their government. They said we couldn't defend our win, but we stuck it out, and we did. Today, Massachusetts lawmakers voted to uphold gay marriage. They said we'd never win in the heartland. Iowa became the third state to allow same-sex marriage. They said we'd never get the people behind us. For the first time, a majority of people support gay marriage. They said we'd never get Republicans to join Democrats and independents on our side. No, freedom means freedom for everyone. And they said we'd never get elected officials, a vice president, and the president to come on board. I think same-sex couples should be able to get married. Some people said we would never, ever win at the ballot, but we learned how to do it. And in 2012, we won four out of four. We convince the nation that love is love. People learned that we were their kids and their cousins and their friends. We were human beings like everybody else. This was our journey, together with a movement of many, a shared strategy we stuck to, a campaign to drive that strategy and spearhead that movement. We learned we built, we rebounded, we kept going. This morning, the Supreme Court recognized that the Constitution guarantees marriage equality. That's the consequence of the countless small acts of courage of millions of people across decades who stood up, who came out, willing to endure bullying and taunts 
and stayed strong and came to believe in themselves and who they were and slowly made an entire country realize that love is love. What an extraordinary achievement. What a vindication of the belief that ordinary people can do extraordinary things. Those countless, often anonymous heroes, they deserve our thanks. They should be very proud. America should be very proud. Love one. We all won. So as you can see from the video, this victory was not something that happened overnight. In the United States, it took more than four decades for us to win the freedom to marry. It took lots of struggle. It took lots of persuasion. It took lots of organizing. It took lots of people doing something in order to bring it forward. There were many ups and downs, many losses. That's what it takes to go from a place of injustice, in this case, oppression, criminalization, stigma, to transformation. It takes work. But as you can also see from the video and from this story, change can happen. When people commit themselves to that change, when people come together and work in organizations and as individuals reaching the people around us, change can happen. And that's the exciting story that is most important to share here in Japan. The details of how we did it, the specifics of our strategy, of our work, of our organizing, of our programs, of our message, these may offer elements to be adapted here in Japan. But the real message that is of, of clear importance to Japan and other countries is that you can do it. It can be done. Now, as you saw also in the video, I was not the first person to think of the idea that gay people should marry. In the United States, this work began with early couples who in the immediate dawn of the gay rights movement, we usually talk about the modern gay rights movement worldwide as beginning in 1969 with the Stonewall Rebellion in the United States where people fought back, actually in my own home city, just a few blocks from where I live, against police harassment and oppression that was then ubiquitous, pervasive at the time. Now, of course, Stonewall really wasn't the beginning. It really wasn't the first. People had taken action and done things before. But we talk about Stonewall as the benchmark because what began on that day had legs. It continued. It prompted people to a higher level of organizing. And that had worldwide repercussions that we still celebrate in pride uh, celebrations and mar months and marches, really all around the world. So if we talk about Stonewall as an artificial historical beginning of the modern chapter of gay rights work in the United States and around the world, it's very, very telling that within just a few years of Stonewall, the very early 1970s, couples all across the United States began fighting for the freedom to marry. Marriage was always a central demand and desire from the very beginning. In that first wave of marriage litigation in the early 1970s, the courts all refused to take action. They all threw these couples away. They all denied the freedom to marry. And in case after case after case, these couples lost. One of those cases even went to the United States Supreme Court. And in 1972, the United Supreme States Supreme Court got it wrong. The United States Supreme Court said, there is no constitutional right to marry for gay people. Ten years later, give or take, I was a young student. I had hair. 
<laughs> and I was at a university much like Keo in the United States, called upon as a young law student to write a paper, to write my third year paper, my thesis. And I knew then that I wanted to write something about how do we change the way in which gay people are treated in the United States and worldwide. And in doing my research and studying to figure out what to talk about, I learned the story of these early pioneering couples, of these early battles, and I drew on history and philosophy and the story of feminism and the, the experience of gay people in different countries throughout society and even popular culture and wove together an argument that said that we should fight for the freedom to marry, we should have the freedom to marry, and we should fight for the freedom to marry. Now, in other words, I was arguing in this paper two different things. Under the general idea that marriage matters and that we should have it and we should fight for it, I argued that marriage is important and therefore worth fighting for. I drew on cases, as well as, as I said, philosophy and morality and religion and uh, popular culture and so on. And one of the things I drew on was a Supreme Court case, a United States Supreme Court, that had involved another group of people who had come before the United States Supreme Court, just like those gay couples in the early 70s because the government was not allowing that other group of people to marry. And so that other group had asked the courts, and eventually it got to the Supreme Court, to order the government to stop discriminating against them when it came to marriage. And in order to decide the case, the Supreme Court said, it needed to first figure out why does marriage matter? Why is marriage important? In order to be able to decide whether it was okay for the government to exclude that group of people from marriage. And so the Supreme Court eventually, in its analysis, identified four essential attributes, four essential elements, four essential reasons why marriage matters in a democratic rule of law country, such as the United States or Japan. The first element, the first attribute that the Supreme Court identified in this case involving those other people was that marriage, the Supreme Court said, represents an opportunity to make a public statement of commitment and love to another person and an opportunity to receive public support for that commitment. That marriage is first and foremost about that affirmation of love and commitment that we make to somebody that we want to build our life with, and it is an opportunity for society through the law, but also in our circle of friends and our community and the places where we work and study to support and affirm that love and commitment and hold us accountable to it. So that's the first important attribute of marriage. Second, the Supreme Court noted that for many, many people, marriage has an important religious or spiritual dimension. Marriage has meaning to people that is not only about the love and commitment and our interaction in society, but is about how we see ourselves in the universe. Third, the Supreme Court noted that marriage offers the prospect of what it very delicately called in legal language, physical consummation. Now we usually call that something else in our day-to-day -day lives. And this desire for intimacy, for sexual expression, for many people is bound up in marriage. And finally, the Supreme Court noted that marriage in the United States, and of course this is also true in Japan, is the gateway the prerequisite, the precondition for a vast array of protections and responsibilities and benefits, public and private, tangible and intangible, legal and economic, an array of meanings and protections that have vast importance for real people, 
Another way of thinking about that is that in our societies, marriage touches every area of life, from birth to death, with taxes in between. The Supreme Court noted, of course, that marriage has other purposes. It often figures significantly in people's desire, for example, to form parent, families, to parent, and so on. But those were not the four essential attributes that the Supreme Court noted. They were the ones that I just mentioned. So in that case, back in 1982, when I, that I was now studying as a student in writing my paper, the Supreme Court had to decide, given those four important attributes, is it OK to deny marriage to the group of people who had come before them? And the Supreme Court weighing the importance of these attributes, why marriage matters to people, said it is not OK for government to exclude arbitrarily the group of people who were then before the court. Does anyone know who that group of people were? The group of people who were then challenging discrimination in marriage in 1982, receiving this unanimous ruling in their favor from the United States Supreme Court, was prisoners. And the Supreme Court said that for these four reasons, marriage is so important that government may not arbitrarily withhold it, even from convicted murderers, even from felons, because marriage matters. And so in 1983, I wrote the case that because of these kinds of attributes, to be denied marriage is to truly harm and unfairly exclude gay people from something very, very important. And therefore, we should not accept that no for an answer. We deserve the freedom to marry. And as this kind of constitutional ruling and the other Supreme Court cases that we know from history around the freedom to marry and the right to marry, most famously the best named case ever in the United States, Loving versus Virginia, Loving versus Virginia, in which the Supreme Court said marriage may not be denied to people just because they want to marry somebody that somebody else might think is of the wrong race. We know from these Supreme Court cases, I argued, that there is a pathway to victory. And therefore, we should have the freedom to marry. But I also argued in that paper that fighting for the freedom to marry is something we as gay people should do. It's something that should be taken seriously in the United States and in societies like Japan. Because by working for the freedom to marry, by talking about gay people and marriage, we would be claiming a language a language of love, commitment, connection, family, social harmony, responsibility, dignity, that would be an engine of transformation for non-gay people. That by talking about gay people's lives in the shared language of marriage, we would help non-gay people better come to understand who gay people are and the shared values that together we must respect and honor and to which we can contribute. That marriage, in other words, would be a way of talking and working and engaging people and creating space not only to win marriage, important as that was, but to transform the place of gay people generally and uphold the national constitutional values that we share and must fight for. The general idea of my paper back in 1983 and of the work that followed was that marriage in a country like America or Japan is not only an important goal, it is also a strategy. It is a way of helping people rise to fairness and changing discrimination and exclusion in the law. So how did we do it? That's why marriage mattered. That's why it was worth fighting for. That's why it was important to claim 
the language of marriage as an engine of change. But how did we do it in the United States? And here again, I want to underscore that the specifics of how we did it in the United States may or may not exactly apply to Japan. But what clearly does apply to Japan are the elements of change, the elements of strategy and success that we were able to claim that you can now adapt to moving your country forward. So the big question in front of us in the United States was how do we get that no that we'd already now gotten from the Supreme Court to a yes? How do we engage the legal and political and other arenas of society to change the, what was wrong and get them to now do what is right? So the way we actually did that required four different things. The other one's on the fourth slide for some, for some teasing, keep up your interest reason. OK, so first of all, we needed the Constitution. Now, when I say the Constitution, I literally mean the document, the guarantee, the promise that our country in the United States has, and that you, of course, have here in Japan. I already quoted you one of the articles from your own Constitution. We are lucky as Japanese, as Americans, as those of us who live in constitutional societies, to have a constitution, to have a guarantee of rights, to have the elements of system, the judiciary, the, the ability to organize, a free press, free speech, these constitutional elements of democratic rule of law societies that enable us to work to make things better. We are lucky, and they are fragile. In the United States, we are now learning again how much we must work to defend them in our own country. Likewise, in Japan, you must defend and exercise these precious gifts that we, in our countries, are lucky to have. What history has always taught us in Japan, in the United States, and in other countries is that wonderful and lucky as it is to have the Constitution and this kind of system, it doesn't automatically fulfill itself. The Constitution is not just a machine that you put a quarter in or put a yen in and get a result out. The Constitution promises equality and freedom and justice and dignity, but it doesn't automatically deliver it. That requires the constant endeavor of the people, and it requires, in particular, three other things. So while we had and needed the Constitution, we also, in order to win the freedom to marry, in order to transform the place of gay people in our society, needed, next, a movement. Now, when I say a movement, what I mean by that is no one person, not just me or anyone else, no one person, no one organization, not my organization, Freedom to Marry, not the organization I worked at, Lambda Legal, not LAN, not Goldman Sachs, no one organization, no one person, no one methodology, not just litigation, not just legislation, not just public education, not just direct action, not just electoral work, no one battle, no one court case, no one state, no one year, for that matter, no one decade alone is enough. No one anything does something this big. It takes a movement. It took millions of conversations, millions of dollars raised and invested in work. It took many organizations, many battles in many different states over many years, over many decades, more than four for us to achieve this transformation. So one of the things one needs is a movement engaging many people, many organizations, many contributions over many years in order to achieve change. But at the same time, despite all this multiplicity, it wasn't just a random set of actions. It wasn't just whatever happens. It wasn't just chaos. It wasn't just a succession of episodes. What we also needed, 
and had under the Constitution with this movement was a strategy. Now, what is a strategy? A strategy is the pathway from where you are, which isn't good enough, to where you want to be. The change, the goal, the vision that you are working for. And with clarity of strategy, you, number one, can organize the work and draw from the movement what's needed in order to achieve the change you're seeking. But the other reason it's important to have a strategy and to proclaim it is to allow other people to see the pathway, to understand that change can happen that there is a way to get what seems very difficult and stuck right now to the vision of hope and, just, and justice and improvement that they can rally to. By putting forward the strategy, you organize your own work, you help figure out what's needed, and you also summon other people to believe in their hearts and then join. And that strengthens your ability to get to the goal. So we needed the Constitution, but it wasn't enough. We needed a movement. We needed a strategy. And to make sure these all came together in the right way, we needed finally, is it not there? Yeah, a campaign. We needed a campaign. We needed somebody who took it upon themselves to make sure that all of these things came together. Now, that campaign in the United States was a new organization that we created called Freedom to Marry. Freedom to Marry had one job, to drive the strategy, leverage the movement, to make sure that the goal of winning marriage nationwide was achieved. Many of the organizations who worked with Freedom to Marry, who were part of the movement, did this piece or that piece or that piece. There were groups like LAM that could organize lawyers and help move public education. There were institutions like KO that hosted events and spoke out from their values. There were business leaders, there were clergy, there were many others who came in to the, to the work. There were young people, there were older people who told stories. Not all of them knew there was a strategy. Not all of them were working exactly like it was a military, because it was a movement, not a military. But there was a campaign, Freedom to Marry, that paid attention to what the strategy required, what the movement was doing, and where things weren't happening that the strategy required could work to try to make sure they did come together in order to get the job done. Another way of saying that is we did well on what I call the ladder of clarity that I think every person and every activist and every organization ought to consider, which is to be clear about what our goal is, to be clear about what the strategy was, needed, was to achieve it, what the pathway is, what's required, to be clear about the vehicles, what are the programs and partnerships and resources and allies who can deliver on the, that strategy, and what are the action steps? What are you giving every single person, every single organization to do so that they can contribute to what the strategy requires to get the job done? We did well with many, many mistakes and stumbles and defeats and bumps. It did take us more than four decades, but we also were able to do it. Here in Japan, as each individual considers whether she or he can make a difference, start by asking yourself, what do you want to achieve? What is your goal for a better Japan? What will it take to achieve that? Who is working on this that I can join? Or if there isn't some place to join, what can you do yourself to make a difference? And likewise, organizations who have a goal, who have a vision, of how Japan should be better, need to ask themselves, have they articulated that goal clearly enough that they can measure work and develop a strategy? 
And have they articulate, articulated that goal clearly enough that others can understand and believe in it and join? Have you laid out the strategy that's necessary, what it will take to win, so that others can join you in that work? And from them flow action steps and vehicles and the work needed. We did a relatively good job in getting those things right. But it wasn't easy, and it didn't happen automatically. We had many stumbles and many setbacks along the way. Now, I could talk about what the strategy was in the United States. And if you're interested, there'll be time for that in Q&A. But the exact strategy of the United States is not as important in, the, in Japan. The important thing in Japan is that you have a strategy. What is the strategy? What will it take to win the freedom to marry, to end the exclusion of Japanese families who happen to be gay from the protection of the law and the respect of society? The exact strategy may be somewhat different in Japan. But the elements of success, including the need to have a strategy, absolutely remains. In the United States, we knew our strategy was we needed to change that no that the early cases had gotten in the Supreme Court to a yes. We knew that in order to do that, litigation, going to court, remained a very important tool and ultimately would be the central vehicle for success. We knew in, that our goal at the end was to get the Supreme Court to bring the freedom to marry to the country. Litigation is the way in which you do that. But we already knew from our own history and our own experience and our own efforts that just doing litigation was not going to be enough. In order to win in the courts of law, we decided, we needed to also win in the court of public opinion. And so we developed a three-track strategy that we called the Roadmap to Victory. And by the way, it wasn't a secret. We put it on our website. We wanted people to know what it was. Why did we want people to know what our strategy was? Because we wanted them to join us. Were we worried that our opponents would find out what the strategy was? No, we, were already, we had already lost. We were already not where we wanted to be. We are the ones who needed a change. We needed to bring people in. And so we proclaimed our strategy and made it clear so that people could believe in it and join it. The strategy in the United States was that we were going to win in the Supreme Court by creating a climate that would encourage and indeed impel the decision makers in society, legislators, presidents, governors, judges, and justices, to do the right thing. In other words, we had to create the climate that got them to understand they could and must change the law. And so we identified in the United States the need to build a critical mass of states to win enough states. Through, some through litigation, from some through legislation, some through ballot measures, to build a critical mass of states and build a critical mass of support to move public opinion, to help people understand why marriage matters, to help people understand better who gay people are and why the values of fairness and freedom and love and dignity argue in favor of treating them with respect. And on a third track, in our circumstances, we needed to tackle and end federal discrimination, the so-called Defense of Marriage Act that Fujita-san referred to earlier, that was added on as an additional layer of discrimination, but never stopped us. And working on these three tracks, we said, we would create the climate that would impel and encourage the decision makers, including the Supreme Court, to change their no to a yes. We developed all kinds of programs in order to make more voices heard in the national discussion, in order to add to that climate. We had mayors for the freedom to marry, asking local leaders to speak out. We had young conservatives 
for the freedom to marry, trying to add the voices of youth and even so-called conservatives to make the case that the, the conservative case for treating people right and changing legal discrimination. We had geographic programs in different cities, in different states. We, in, we organized clergy coalitions and opportunities for religious voices to be heard. We organized programs and, and, and coalitions and campaigns that featured people of color, racial minorities, and others. We had a program called, for example, Familia es Familia that elevated the stories of Latino Americans and their families and why marriage mattered to them. We organized in the business community. We organized, as I said, young people and students. We also brought in and organized and motivated and asked for support from experts. We wanted society to be hearing from the doctors, the pediatricians, the psychiatrists, the teachers, and in one powerful example, businesses. By the time we stood in front of the US Supreme Court in 2015 and put forward what are called friend of the court briefs, which are arguments and evidence put forward by people who are not in the case but have an opinion and want to help the court get the case right, we had all kinds of expert voices who'd already spoken out in legislative debates, in society, in advertising, in organizing, in meetings, in forums like this one hosted at KO. And they also put in briefs, arguments to the Supreme Court. And one of those was a brief filed by, as you see, 379 businesses, including Goldman Sachs, some of the major businesses in the United States and globally, who argued to the Supreme Court that ending the exclusion of gay people from marriage would be good for society, good for those people, in the same way that it was already, to the best of their ability, good for these companies. These companies said, we already have programs aimed at boosting diversity and inclusion and respect for gay people like minor other minorities, like women, because this is what makes a stronger team. This is what makes better work product. This is what reaches a broader market. This is what's good for our company and it would be good for our country, but you, the government, are in our way. 379 businesses, including many businesses operating right here in Japan, have already taken the position that the freedom to marry will be good not just for gay people, but for the companies, the economy, and the country. And these are the kinds of voices we brought forward to win in the court of law just as we had succeeded in winning in the court of public opinion. And these are the kinds of voices who need to be enlisted and elevated in the discussion here in Japan. Now, I already said some of the things we did in the United States may or may not be exactly the exact kinds of things you need to do in Japan, though many of the elements, I'm quite confident, are very much the same. In Japan, as in the United States, the chief engine of change is conversation. And so it is crucial that gay and non-gay people and organizations who want to move Japan forward engage in activities that will promote conversation, person to person, group to group, throughout society. The more we can ask people to look at their values to think about what they believe in, to hear the stories of real gay people, people here in Japan, family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, parents, children, and understand better those lives and the shared values of respect and harmony and fairness and freedom and dignity. The more we have people talking about this, the more we create space that will move public opinion higher and higher, putting more pressure on and creating more opportunity for decision makers like the members of the Diet and the courts. Conversation is the chief engine of change. And if you're gay, 
The more you talk about who you are, what your life is like, your dreams, the discrimination you experience, and your hopes to contribute to Japan, the more you talk about that, first to the people you feel comfortable talking with, and then to the next circle, and then to the next circle. You don't have to start with the hardest. Start with the easiest. But gay people must add our voices and our stories to give non-gay people a chance to learn and to grow and to rise to fairness. And for every gay person, whether in this room or in this work, for every one gay person, there are 10 non-gay people. So non-gay people also have a tremendous opportunity to add their voices and make a difference. Fujitsu-san is a perfect example of that. His gay coworker and friend and colleague came to him and talked about his life in, pri in privacy and maybe even a little afraid. And Fujita was moved by this and had to think about it, but thought about it and thought about what kind of person am I? Do I believe that other people should be treated differently or worse from me? This colleague whom I respect now tells me something I didn't know about him. Does that change who he is? Or does it mean that I have to change what I thought? And not content with just thinking that through, which most fair people are willing to do, he also decided that means he had to take action. And he has become a prominent voice and a real change maker, even though he himself is not gay, but because he believes in the respect due to the gay people in his life, but also he believes in what kind of country Japan should be. Gay people and non-gay people all have the power of our voices. The question is, will we use them to move our country forward? It is important to create opportunities to give other people the chance to rise to fairness. And we can do that as individuals, and we can do that by working with others in organizations in a campaign like the kind I just described. That campaign in Japan, I believe, can work through the courts and can maybe ultimately call on the Japanese Supreme Court to uphold the Constitution. But based on my understanding of this country, you all are much better experts than I, the real focus of attention needs to be the diet. This law discriminates. The diet can change the law. The parties, the government, the legislature, and at some point, the courts all have an opportunity and a responsibility to move Japan forward. And this is what Japan can and must do at this time. Now, when Japan does this, will it be the first to have to take this step? Is this an experiment? Is this something scary or unknown or uncertain? Will Japan be jumping off a cliff in taking an action under its constitution to end discrimination and exclusion against Japanese people in this country? Of course not. I already told you, by the time I finished my work in the United States, we were not, as we might have been, number one. We were number 22. Well, today, 25 countries 25 countries, it says 26, but it's 25 countries on six continents now have, are now places where gay people can share in the freedom to marry. The reason it says 26 is that late last year, there was also a ruling from the High Court of Austria saying that a year from now, Austria will also end marriage discrimination. And that will be, unless there are others in the meantime, 26. But there are 25 countries in the world where gay people can now marry. So we would know if there were something bad happening. If this was a scary new thing that wasn't a good idea, it would be clear because you could look at what's happening in the United States, what's happening in Brazil, what's happening in France, what's happening in South Africa. Have bad things happened? But in fact, we now have a mountain of evidence and experience we now have a mountain of evidence from countries all around the world, from courts, from legislatures, from actual experience, showing that where gay people can marry, families are helped, and no one is hurt. 
So when Japan now is asked to consider what should Japan do, it doesn't just have to take a guess. It doesn't just have to take a leap. There's nothing scary or unknown about this because we have the track record and the experience. In fact, the question for Japan today is does Japan want to join the countries whose values it shares, in whose economies it is entwined, and move forward and do the right thing, or does Japan want to lag behind? Of the G7 countries, the world's global economic leaders and political partners, of the G7 countries who meet every year, and Japan takes its turn at hosting, and it goes to these meetings leader by leader, year by year. Of the G7 countries, there is exactly one that does not yet provide national protection and respect for same-sex couples. One out of the seven that has not yet done this. And that country is Japan. Of all the other G7 countries, the six of the seven who have moved forward, the majority of those countries, almost all, have begun to provide these protections and respect, not by creating something other or lesser or different, whether it's called civil union or partnership or whatever. They have ended exclusion from marriage. The majority of the G7 countries are countries that have affirmed the freedom to marry for same-sex couples and move forward. And not one of them has seen anything bad happen because of this progress. Now, the good news for Japan is even though that G7 fact is a bit of a call to action for Japan, the only one that hasn't done it, and even though you all know that the eyes of the world are turning to Japan with the Olympics coming here. And the world is going to look and say, is Japan living up to the values it promises and the values it shares with countries like this? Or is Japan lagging behind so a clock is ticking? Even though Japan is not where it needs to be and the clock is ticking and the eyes of the world are looking, the good news is you saw in the film that there came a moment in our very long, decades-long battle where the news re began to report that for the first time, a majority of Americans have come to support the freedom to marry. That little clip you saw in the film, that benchmark of success that we achieved in the United States of getting majority support amongst the people, that benchmark for us came in 2010. That is to say, almost 30 years after we began the fight. The good news for Japan is you're already there. Polling in 2015 showed that a majority of the Japanese people believe in fairness. A majority of the Japanese people already support the freedom to marry. And unlike the United States and many of these other countries on this list, unlike the United States, you do not have uh, a hostile, harsh, oppositional climate. You do not have uh, a significant, angry majority or even minority attacking gay people and opposing progress for the country. You don't have these obstacles, and you're already ahead of where we were. The big challenge for Japan is there's too much silence. There's too much politeness. There's too much refusal to talk about this. Refusal on the part of gay people who don't speak up enough to give our friends and family and neighbors and fellow citizens a chance to move. And too much silence, too much politeness, too much working within the system, too much not rocking the boat on the part of non-gay and gay people together in the organizations who are the ones who have to lead the change. So that's the good news and the bad news. But it really, in my mind, amounts to good news for Japan. Because you do not have the barriers or the obstacles that many of us did have 
in many of these battles. You do not have the need to start from the beginning in a situation where there's no information. You have this vast record of experience to draw on and point to. All these countries with the freedom to marry amounts to 1.1 billion people on the world today who live in a freedom to marry country, up from zero when I started. All those hairs, that's now 1.1 billion people who now have the freedom to marry. This is what you have to work with. And you have the example from the United States and other countries that change can happen. This is my fifth time in Japan. I love coming to Japan. It's a wonderful country with a deep and rich history and extraordinarily polite and kind and welcoming and smart and talented people. This is a country that has to join in moving the world forward at a time when democracy and the rule of law are threatened. This is a country that must live up to its values. And what we know from the experience of history and countries like the United States is it doesn't help happen by itself. It takes organizations and institutions and people to get out there and make a difference. But what we do know is that when that happens, so does change. It's Japan's time. It's time for the freedom to marry in Japan. Let's do it. Well, thank you very much, Evan. Um, my name is Ayana Kai. I'm also an attorney from L LAN, L Lawyers for LGBT and Allies Network. Um, I would like to coordinate the Q&A session. I am sure um, it was a very impressive session, and a lot of you guys may have questions to Evan. So uh, would you please raise your hand if you want to speak up? Um, can I start with the lady in the front? Um, can I, should I make a question really quick or can I make a really long statement? Yeah. As you want. Okay. I don't know okay, about really you. long. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for a really inspiring um, lecture today. I was really excited to be here. So I have a question. As you said earlier that there are four attributes of marriage, like emotional love and commitment, two, uh, spiritual and religious, uh, three, uh, sexual force and everything, you know, regal, economical, and like, so, so constantly, constantly from the really long and harsh discrimination towards LGBT community in a Western country, Western and Christian countries like United States, I think that as, a, as women in the video had said that creating, establishing a new legal partnership for LGBT communities isn't enough because this is not about marriage for everyone. It's about uh, equality to love, uh, equality to have a right to love. So, so you're, I think the main purpose of the same-sex campaign in the United States or other Western or Christian country is to emphasizing emotional and sexual and religious aspect of marriage because it is not about legal creating a legal right for LGBT community, but it's about about the long discrimination, the history of discrimination towards LGBT community. It's about combat discrimination. So as you said that same-sex campaign, sex, sex marriage campaign is not about, it's one of, one of the strategies that you took for to make people real, non-gay people realize that who gay people are, as you said. But I think you said that Japan does not have obstacle that the United States had, that there aren't hard discrimination towards LGBT community, but, but there are too much politeness, too much silence. But I really don't think that 
there the, that non-existence that that the discrimination doesn't exist i mean superficially there isn't enough harsh discrimination for the community in japan but i think this is one of the obstacles that japanese community will face concerning the legalization of same-sex marriage because like you said the G in g7 country japan is the only country that same-sex marriage isn't realized in but officially legalized, but I think like in considering 1990s that like Japan has been the only country that pills are not uh, Can I say it approved in that what pills uh, pills, pills? Like for drugs you mean medication it's for the for the women. Yeah, for it's, it's, it's the birth, birth control pills country. for birth the women control has been uh, has been approved in UN community, UN a member of the United Nations. But I think that the Japan, the strategies, uh, Japan, the, the strategy Japan should take is not emphasizing the emotional or sexual aspect of marriage. I think that emphasizing the, the, the legal or economical aspect of marriage is that Japan should take because I, you said a conversation is really important, but I think conversation concerning about emotional or sexual aspect of marriage is really difficult in Japan. So I think that the, one of the strategies that Japan should take is that the the marriage is one of it is people can think that marriage is is a symbol of love or commitment, but I also we can say that marriage is is just one of the social contracts that two civilians make. So. I think that the, the strategies that Japan should pursue would be emphasizing the legal or dry kind of aspect of marriage. And this is a question for Fujita-san, so do you think that Japan should take that, that kind of strategy? Or, and that, this is a question for Mr. Um, Wolfson, that have you ever thought of the establishing new kind of citizenship for LGBT or non-gay people for that, the, I mean, like the one, the like one the French government did, PAX. Yeah. Okay. So you you add, had a lot of good thoughts and put a lot of things together. Uh, let me say first of all, as I said, the exact strategy that Japan should use does not have to be the same exact strategy as the United States. You, you know, it's a different country with a different system. I think in Japan, the victory is more likely to come through the diet. And therefore, you, what you need to think about is what will it take to move the diet to do the right thing? How do you engage the parties? How do you engage your, your local representatives in your cities and communities and so on? What do you do to engage them and build a majority? How do you uh, in, punish some candidates who don't do the right thing? How do you support candidates who do the right thing? Those kinds of things, those are going to be at least as important as what's the legal argument and when do we go to court? and so on. Uh, in, the, in Japan, you have one system. You have a national system. In the United States, we had a federal system with different states. So we could work different strategies. Different, so, so the strategy exactly doesn't have to be the same. But the elements of the strategy, I believe, are very similar. You talked about, you asked, for example, the question, should we in Japan talk more about the legal and less about the emotional? Well. You know Japan better than I do, but my guess would be no. The answer would be no, because even when you are trying to win a legal argument, even when you are closing the deal with the lawmaker or the court, they are, part, they are in an environment where they feel and maybe are influenced by what the people think. And in my view, people are not now, there are some people who are moved by law or principle or rules and so on. There are some people who care about those things. I, I'm one of those people. I care about this. I, I wrote about the freedom to marry before I was in love, before I had anybody I was in, wanted to marry. It wasn't about getting married. To me, it was about justice and the Constitution. So that's me. But that's not everybody. Most people have to be reached through the heart they have to be moved by stories and people and values, and then they will follow a legal argument. 
It's not an either or, we need both. But I believe in Japan, what's missing is enough discussion about who gay people are in Japan, what their families are like, the children they are raising, the good work they're doing as honorable sons and daughters and members of companies and organizations, and that they have a dream of being part of the family. These are, these are not legal arguments. These are about emotion and about people and about values. And I think in Japan, that's what will make the difference. The legal argument is relatively easy. We have brilliant legal scholars at KO and other places. We have great lawyers. They know how to write a legal argument. They will go to Article 12 and talk about constant endeavor of the people. They will go to Article 13 and 14 that talk about dignity and freedom and equal protection and, and all the basic rights. They will go to Article 24 of the Japanese Constitution, the second sentence of which says, choice of spouse must be determined by maximum freedom and dignity and equality for all. They will know how to write the legal argument, but they need to do that in an environment that says yes, yes, yes. And that means we need to reach ordinary Japanese people with personal stories and personal engagement and values. Now somebody like you, you may or may not have a personal story about being gay or not being gay, I don't know you, so you may not have it, but, but you already represent somebody who stands up and says, I care about this. I want Japan to be better. I may know gay people or I may have values of wanting to live in a society that doesn't discriminate and so on. That's the kind of personal ask that makes a difference. The exact message, the exact words, that's not a strategy. Messaging is a tactic. It's a piece of the work that follows from the strategy. You first need to ask yourself, who do I need to move? What do I need to do? Then you think about what will help move this one or that one or that one. And that's how you put together a strategy to win in Japan. Did you want to? If I may. Yeah. Um, so first I would say thank you for asking the question because this is exactly what needs to happen. We need to have a conversation. So um, thank you for doing that. Wish to hire you as a strategist. Yeah, come on in. <laughs> Second, I, you know, I, I think it depends, right? So not one tactic works for all. There, the society is constituted of many, many elements. It, it could be the diet, it could be corporations, it could be the government, it could be Prime Minister Abe, it could be Gaku Hashimoto. You have to read that person, what that person is interested in, what that person cares about. And so I think the strategy, whether it be emotion, passion, or logic, will depend on the person or the segment you are dealing with. And unfortunately, I don't think uh, I've worked hard enough, our organization has worked enough, hard enough, and you know, for that matter, there aren't any organization that has an omnipotent view of what is needed to move the hearts and minds uh, so that they will take action for change, and um, that's what we need to do. We need to identify the segments, the social segments that we need to speak to, have a conversation with. We need to engage, as uh, Evan says, in millions of conversation, and you know, um, find out what moves people. And you know, I, I think those documentaries that we created about the two couples, we've shown it at various corporations at their seminars. I thought that was powerful. I have seen action from various corporations. Having seen that, uh, you know, they call other companies within their industry segment and say, you know, we got to come to this um, event at Daini Tokyo Bar Association to see the movie because I think it's important. And that starts a conversation, and that starts another conversation. And yeah, that's what I would say. Right. Yeah. And again, it's, it's about combining the conversations, the persuasion, the storytelling, the voices, business, psychology, medicine, schools, youth, combining all of that with political organizing and sometimes litigation. It's not just up here. It's also, are we making sure that the members of the diet are hearing from the people? Are we, are that, are we making sure that they're hearing from businesses? that have come out in support, whether it's through a brief 
or through a meeting or through political engagement. You have to combine those things. But again, in Japan, you're starting from here. We started from here. You're starting from here. Keep going. Thank you. Um, I think we can continue talking about this topic forever. But um, do we have another question? So can we have this gentleman? Thank you. Uh, I lead a group called LGBT Student of KO, consisting of among 50 mem members from KO University who are LGBT themselves. And I share a lot of ideas that uh, so you just said about like in Japan, it's not about the, the people who are against it, but like people who are apathetic about the whole issue. And my question is actually for uh, Kumamura Sensei. I was in one of your class last year. I knew last year you were also elected to be one of the governor of Keio University. So in Keio University, we have now we have um, support for transgender students for them to use their uh, name to to use their ch change the name. We have some kind of system supporting LGBT student in that way. But concerned of LGB student student of um, uh, uncommon uh, sexual minority of sexual orientations. In many cases, they like the people around me. They live in silence. They never tell anyone, even in, in this university or in their family, they live a double life, they come to our group, and then they talk with other gay students in the university. And yeah, even there's 60 of us in this university, and I think many people, other students in the university ask, oh, I never heard of any other gay student in this university. So as governor, newly elected governor, is there anything like university-wise you want to help the care university you know, to implement any new uh, project to help you be a more diverse certified place and you know, more welcoming to all people? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to know that KO is actually supporting the change of the names, but um, Kumar says, would you take that question? So uh, in the first place, I am not um, governor, right? <laughs> so uh, I'm just a vice president. Actually, I'm not the president of this university. Well, yes, that's right. That's right. <clears throat> so uh, um, the, what I'm talking about um, is not official statement of this university. It's just you know personal uh, uh, sayings. So um, actually, uh, today, uh, here is another vice president right over there who is in charge of the uh, human resources. So uh, <coughs> she would uh, take a responsibility to uh, respond to you. But, uh, <laughs> but this, this is uh, uh, my, my project, so I, I have to uh, make some response to you. So uh, yes, um, we, I like to uh, talk about the LGBT issues within the campuses. Uh, um, and uh, we, uh, executive board of, of Care University, is currently planning to establish new office for uh, 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 diversity, uh, uh, work balance, and inclusion. So it will be uh, 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 set up uh, in, in, in next, ne next, next month. So it, it, it's going to be some uh, umbrella type uh, office, not just for LGBT. It's, it, it's but for uh, minorities and uh, religious and uh, um, uh, sexual orientation, something like that. So we we're going to have uh, some channel to talk uh, with those minorities to uh, think about. Um, some uh, measures to uh, help them uh, to uh, 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 live this and uh, study uh, uh, safely and, uh, and, and, and satisfactory in, in this university. So we're going to have some, some, some new measures for uh, talk to the, that minority. So, so, let, so keep uh, in touch 
uh, with, your, uh, with you and your organization. So I'm going to uh, give you uh, my name card right here. OK. Well, and if I just may, so the answer you just heard and from uh, Iwanami-san as well uh, is an example of how people in power can and are thinking about how to move Japan forward, how to understand better the needs of uh, gay and transgender people and make a better community and make a better country. That's how it's supposed to work. Your being willing to stand up and ask people in power what they are doing and to encourage them and offer to help them, help them by giving them information and help them by pushing is very much the kind of activism that is needed to make things forward. So I congratulate you on being a perfect example of what we need more people to do. And I would, I would guess that one of the things they may need from you and your organization, which it, and it's wonderful that people have come together in an organization, is some real stories. What are the experiences you've had of discrimination, of isolation, of stigma, but also the examples of the courage and commitment and your willingness to do the work and to tell the story to move other people. This is, this is exactly what we need, and we need it not only within Keio University, we need that within Japan. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I would also like to exchange card with you later. Um, um, I think I had another question from the lady in the gray sweater in the front. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Mr. Wolfson and Mr. Fujita for making time in their busy schedule to come to KO today. Thank you very much, and thank you for organizing this event. Um, my question is that um, Mr. Wolfson has said that in Japan, the majority of the people are for marriage equality for same-sex couples. However, I also believe that the problem in Japan is that most non-gay people feel indifferent to them. And when asked, are you for or against marriage equality, they would say yes, but they're not willing to fight for the right. They don't feel an injustice that same-sex couples aren't allowed to get married. And I wanted to ask what I could do as an individual to make a difference and um, me personally, I find it a little bit uncomfortable talking about sexual orientations, and I don't want to be like that. And I want it, I want to be able to have my friends or my family or people that I care about be able to open up and talk about their experiences. So um, I would like some advice on how to do that. Thank yes. you. Yes, well, that's an excellent set of questions. Thank you. And it relates a little bit to some of what you asked about, too. So uh, you, you're absolutely right. The, on the one hand, the good news is you in Japan are already starting here, not here, where we were. A majority supports. But is it something they deeply understand? Is it something they're deeply motivated? Is it something they voted on or talked to their lawmakers about? No. And that's what your work is right now. The work of organizations like LAN and the student group and, and others, businesses and so on, Goldman Sachs, everybody who cares about this, the challenge is to take action, to build a campaign, to do the work of reaching out to those people, the fair-minded, reachable people, not the worst, the reachable, and, and talk with them. And the two big messages are, on the one hand, reassurance, helping them understand that this is not about something terrible or scary or dangerous. It's about real people, including like this, our student friend that we just heard from and the people. It's painting a picture of who are gay people in Japan for real. What are their lives really like? Telling their stories, talking about their dreams and their needs, because those, those people may they want to be fair, but they don't necessarily know. Maybe they haven't ever really had a conversation with a gay person. Maybe they haven't really uh, understood that actually they have a, a, a cousin or a, a, a coworker or even a son or daughter who went to Keio and at Keio can be out, but when he goes home is not. They, don't, they may not know that. So 
we need to reassure people in a big way by telling the stories and painting a picture and sharing the information of the experience, good, not bad, in all these other countries, and why this matters. So message number one is to give people that information to help them think about wanting to be fair and wanting to be just and wanting to have a good Japan and wanting to be nice and so on. The equally important other message we have to give is urgency. That every day that Japan does not do this is a day that real people are harmed. It really matters. It, it creates the isolation and stigma and fear that our student friend here talked about. Why should 60 students at Keio, a wonderful, important institution and a welcoming school, why should they be feeling like they don't have support? Like they can't come out, like they can't be themselves. They can't even talk to maybe their classmates or their professors, let alone maybe to their parents, let alone to the diet or to society. Is that how we want people to be living? So we need people to hear that this matters. Every day we don't fix this is a day of injustice and harm that really hurts young people in Japan and the society as a whole. One of my favorite moments since winning the freedom to marry. That, that was pretty good, you know, 32 years of work and you win, it's good. But after that, there was something else that also happened that made me feel really good. And that was that a, a highly respected medical journal in the United States reported on a study and found that in places where we have won the freedom to marry, where we have moved forward, the rate of teen suicide has fallen. It's fallen, in their report, by about 14%, saving hundreds of thousands, well, at least 100,000 lives every year. Now, why is that? Well, it's not because those teens are getting married tomorrow. They're teenagers. But it's because where we have won the freedom to marry, the conversation, the demonstration that people care, that this is a society that welcomes and supports everybody, is a message to those young people that they can have hope and can look forward to the future and that they are supported. Well, that's a message that should be sent in Japan. And so what can you do? You can, as an individual, whether gay or not gay, do what you just did. Stand up and say why this matters to you. And you can make sure you're having that conversation with everybody in your life. Start, start with the easy ones but have the conversation, break the silence. You can say, you know, I just went to a hopefully interesting program at KO today. I, went, I heard this lecture and he said blah, blah, blah. And then this student stood up and said blah, blah, blah. What do you think? Get your friend to talk, get your mom to talk, get your neighbors and coworkers to talk and talk about it. And then you talk about why does it matter to you? And if they're not where they need to be, Give them some more information and give them some more time and give them another ask and another ask. That's the engine of change. So every individual in this room has that power. And you don't have to start with the scary one. Don't go to your, your grandfather or, or, <laughs> or your boss or, or somebody you're afraid of unless you are not afraid. Go to the people you are comfortable talking to and start with that and then give them a chance to move and then go to the next one and the next one. That's what every individual can do. But we can also do something else. That's what we do as individuals. We can also join with others in teams to get the work done. When 60 individual students do, one, do their thing, it has an effect with their roommate or their friend or whatever. When they come together as an organization, they start producing publications and collecting data and meeting with people in power, hopefully not only the university, but also the members of the diet and businesses. When businesses take action, they join together and they file briefs. When people come together in organizations like LAN, they say, we're gonna work together to create tools and opportunities for more individuals to get involved and take action. So join an organization, bring your friends, that's how change happens. It may sound small or, or limited, but that's how we won in the United States. 
And if we can win in the United States, you can win in Japan. And it starts with people like you doing exactly what you did, saying why you care and asking how you can help. Thank you very much. I, uh, can I bring the mic with the lady in the front in the green coat? Uh, hi, I'm Nancy Snow, and I was here at KO as well. I was an Abe Fellow and research professor, and I'd like to give some credit to KO University because when I was here, I saw the university as rather conservative. And uh, when I left in 2015, uh, I wouldn't have expected that uh, KO would be hosting you today, Evan. So I'm really pleased to see this. I think it says something about the issue of freedom to marry in Japan as a whole. I also want to bring up the fact that I attended the LAN Gala in September. And I'm not sure if you all are aware, you mentioned uh, taking action in the diet, but also Koike, the Tokyo Metropolitan Governor, who is uh, well known throughout the world, uh, partially for her kimono from the Rio <laughs> closing ceremony, she issued a statement to that gala recognizing the need to have a conversation on marriage equality. When I saw that slide go up, my jaw dropped because I have seen Japan change dramatically over time. I am LGBT, and I have to tell you, I worked for the Department of State in Washington, D.C. 25 years ago, when I was hired, I could not come out and talk about my life because I was putting my security clearance at risk. And it was considered then an issue of blackmail. That's how far we've come today. So this is a historic moment. And I really appreciate that all of you are here. And I appreciate so much the words of Evan and the others to really encourage more movement on this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can I have? Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I'd like to ask you about your um, hopes and fears at this time. Um, I mean, um, for example, those um, so-called state religious freedom bill might have some adverse impact on the freedom to marry. So what are your hopes and fears at this time and perhaps under the present administration? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we have a wonderful story to tell in the United States and, uh, and of this campaign and the victory, but we are not done. There's tremendous work still to do in the United States. There, there, there's a lot of work to do. Some of it is defending against attacks, as you mentioned. Some of it is, while marriage is important, it's not the only thing that matters. We also want non-discrimination in employment and housing and public accommodations like businesses and theaters and bathrooms and so on. And we want people to have good lives and to feel secure, not just worrying about the law, but also uh, do their friends treat them well? Do their families treat them well? So there's huge amounts of work still to do in the United States. We are not finished in the United States, just as you are not finished in Japan. It is also true that in the United States, because we're not finished, there are attacks that are coming from some lawmakers and some political parties and, and some uh, executive officials and branches and so on, and we have to fight them. Uh, when you ask, though, my fears, I, that actually is not my fear, because I know we will fight and we can fight and we will win. We have been at worst moments as gay people, and we have fought against worst battles and won. So while I wish that we did not have to keep fighting, history tells us you always have to keep working, have to keep fighting. And we will do that, and we will win. My fear is, much, is not so much as a gay person, but it is as an American uh, and as a, a citizen of the world, because the current regime that we have in, in our government right now is a terrible danger 
to not just to gay people, but to the United States and to the West and to liberal democracy. And there are forces in the world who are pushing hard against democracy and trying to undermine societies like ours. And so I don't just worry as a gay person, I care about this as, as a citizen, as a person, as a, as a person who believes in liberal democracy and freedom and pluralism and respect and who believes in the values of the West uh, and of constitutional democracy such as, such as those we share. So that's what I care more about feeling uh, a call to action and an urgency. And of course, if we do that work successfully, we also will advance the work of protecting uh, gay people and transgender people and women and immigrants and people of color and uh, others who are under assault from this regime and from these forces of uh, authoritarianism and ugliness and discrimination that are, are unfortunately uh, resurging in the world right now. It's not just an American problem, though we have our problem, but it, it's, a, it's a problem we see that we all have to work on. And by the way, that's one more reason why it is so important that Japan, a democracy, a constitutional republic, or a constitutional government, a country committed to these values, it's so important that Japan get where it needs to be. Because if the, if the human rights countries don't do what they're supposed to do, how can we push back against the, the worst countries, the countries that are authoritarian and who don't believe in human rights and who don't respect women and don't respect gay people and don't respect basic human rights and values? So countries like the United States and Japan must live up to our values in order to keep lifting up the values around the world. I think we have time for one last question. Okay, so can I have the lady in the middle? Oh, thank you for your great presentation. I have one question about, not about Japan, but about some countries. Um, some countries in the world set death penalty on sexual intercourse uh, re related to religious issue. Um, how do the people in those countries get freedom to marry? So, as I've already said now several times, and uh, I just repeated a moment ago, uh, there are countries like ours that even though they're not perfect, and even though there are problems, and even though in the United States we have a terrible regime that was imposed upon us that we have to get, take care of, even with all of that, we are lucky to live in societies that have a commitment to human rights and democracy and rule of law and women's equality and pluralism, et cetera. We just have to make those values real. We are, we are lucky, but we also have to do the work. There are, as you said, however, many other countries that are not as lucky, that do not have the systems, the political systems, the commitment to human rights, et cetera, that, that we are lucky to have and have to defend. And so in those countries, of course, it's much more difficult. It is difficult because they're not only fighting for this and this and this and this, they're fighting for this. The human rights guarantees of democracy and rule of law and pluralism and freedom. But we also must, so, so one way we fight to make that better is, as I was just saying a moment ago, our countries have to hold up human rights, have to live up to our promise, have to make the case and by doing that, we create momentum in the world that pushes back against the authoritarianism and the sexism and the racism and the anti-gay attitudes and so on that are easier to manifest in countries that do not have protections and safeguards in a system. So we have to do our part in order to keep worldwide momentum. It is also true that the more countries we add to that list that I had there before, the more we create more conversation worldwide, more evidence, more inspiration that encourages people in those countries and gives them more to work with. And even though it doesn't immediately take effect, they still have ugliness to deal with, it gives them what, more to work with in changing their societies. 
you know, it's very hard in the world today, even under authoritarian regimes and even under regimes that are trying to shut things down and, and choke off information and s suppress freedom and so on, they still are part of a global conversation. And the more we have that global conversation moving in the right direction, the more we give more people in more parts of the world the chance to move forward. And so those of us who are lucky to not be here, but to be here, have to keep reaching for here because we deserve to be here and they deserve to be here. So that's the work we have to do. It's a, it's a very ugly and difficult and scary time in the world today for ma in many ways. But it is also a time where in, on some measures, things are better in the world than they've ever been before. There's more empowerment of women. There's more education. There's more access to the basic necessities of life in the world today. We now have the freedom to marry for 1.1 billion people up from zero when I started. So, on. so we have to take the good, not get paralyzed by the bad, and do our work to make it better. Thank you. Um, as much as we would like to continue, I think this is, it's time to close the lecture. So thank you very much again, Evan. Thank you. Domo arigato. Thank you. And we would like to have a closing remark from Professor Komamura. So uh, usually uh, this kind of conference uh, gives the coordinator the privilege to ask additional questions beyond the limit of time. But uh, today, I'm not going to uh, use this privilege. I just uh, close this uh, conference. So um, uh, thank you for a fascinating presentation. So we uh, um, um, improved very much. And uh, uh, this event uh, would encourage a law student uh, to uh, uh, move forward to the next step uh, of our uh, society. So um, here is uh, um, one, one more, uh, two uh, good news. Actually, uh, uh, we are going to establish a new office for diversity and inclusion. This is a, one good news uh, for you and for you. And um, another good news, a very, little bit of small good news, uh, I will start a new course uh, at the uh, Keio Law School in the next spring semester, uh, titled, titled uh, LGBT Law and Society, uh, with uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Fujita, Fujita-san and uh, Ms. Nakai-san. So uh, I think um, it, it, it's going to be a launch uh, 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 in our uh, academic uh, calendar uh, in next week or something like that. So uh, please, uh, I'm expecting, um, um, I'm expecting the pile of the conversation and communication and deliberation with uh, 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 law students or, or some other students from the graduate school. Okay, uh, thank you so much for coming uh, in such a super day. Uh, so please uh, give uh, your hands again for Mr. Ivan Wolfson.